Awesome. Well, we are honored and privileged, again, as I said, uh, to be here this morning and to deliver a word from the Lord. And um, if you will, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. This morning, we're going to be talking about the significance of faith. The significance of faith. And how many of you know faith is real significant? I mean, it, it's, it's, almost, it, it's almost the most important part of, of the puzzle here, right? As us being Christians and walking this life, we need faith. The Bible goes as far as to say that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we need faith in our lives. So we're going to be talking about the significance of this particular faith that we have in Christ. And let's see what Peter has to say about the significance of faith. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Peter is taking a moment here, and Peter is bringing to our remembrance that Christ has paid the ultimate price for our salvation through the sprinkling, sprinkling of his blood and the death of his son. And I don't know about you, but I feel there's times where we don't remember often enough the price that Christ paid for us on the cross of Calvary. Sometimes we can go through a whole month or a whole week without really reflecting on the gospel of Jesus and what he's done. Some of us have been saved in this room for X amount of years, and it becomes a habit and routine that when we take communion, it's just another thing that we do. Some of us, we've just been saved over the past course of a month, and now that we do communion, it's the world to you. Can I just remind you, never lose your first love and passion for Christ. Never lose that passion because the passion that he exhibited on the cross is the passion that we should exhibit to him in our worship every single day. Because of his hope, it is an anchor for our soul that we should relish in that God has given his life, that we could have life. Because if God didn't give his life, we don't have life. If God didn't pay the sacrifice, there is no process of sanctification for us. So I'm just so thankful and so honored, and I'll speak personally, that God is on the throne He's on the throne, and you can join me in just thanking God this morning that he sits on the throne, and because he did what he did, you are where you are. Come on, somebody. Man, if not for Jesus, where would we be? And listen, I just want to say, because it's Youth Sunday, I have enlisted some help to preach this message this morning. I felt like this was such a huge topic that I needed some backup. I needed, I needed my crew to come in and really help me preach this thing. And the type of crew that I put together, I, let, me, let me rewind, that God put together are three middle schoolers. Come on, they are 11 and 12 years old, and they have taken on the task to preach the gospel to you this morning in such a real way. And there was a certain point that we were sitting over the course of four weeks uh, in our study and our dissecting of, of what we were going to be talking about. I was writing on the whiteboard, and there was a certain point where I just, I took the, uh, the marker, and I just kind of sat back, and I just let them talk about God. And the passion that they had about God and the seriousness that they had about God, they were speaking as if they were in their 30s or 40s. They just had this passion and wisdom that was so incredibly amazing. And I just said, you know what? You have to speak on a Sunday morning, on Youth Sunday, and deliver a message to God's people that will forever change our hearts and minds. So, City Church, would you help me welcome our first speaker this morning, Marie Woods. Kill it. Hello, everyone. My name is Marie Woods, like Pastor Joe said. I've been attending City Church for a while now. When I grow up, I plan to be a children's pastor, so I hope this can make this happen. So I'm going to be talking about timeless faith. First, Peter says in 1 Peter 4-5, through 5, 
to inherit the imperishable, unfit, unfulfilled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power is being guarded through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in time. To me, that's saying that God has incredible plans for all of you. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Jesus had knew that he was going to have to be nailed to the cross since the day he was born. So the time that he died for our sins to become whole, for us to become whole for him. My next point is imperishable faith. To me, that's saying that your faith is going to last forever and ever and ever. Ephesians 1.18 says, you having the seen the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know the hope for which has been called, for you, called you for the riches of his glorious inheritances in, his, in the saints. That's saying that you are the brightest diamond in the jewelry store, that you're gorgeous to God, that you're going to have incredible plans. God told me at the age of nine years old that I was going to be a children's pastor. I'm not, you're, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It matters how many times you get up. My second point is unshaken faith. My faith has been shaken a whole bunch of times. You think that a 12-year-old, 11-year-old, or even younger doesn't have problems. but they do. Kids go through bullying every day. You see kids get picked on for no reason at all. Well, let me tell you, I don't get picked on, but I sure enough have nine weeks of exams, I have school, I have church, and then I had a whole bunch of stuff on my plate. I have three brothers. That's a lot to do just during the day. So Philippians 4 through 6 says, Always in my prayers, my prayers of mine, for you are making the, my prayers with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that who begins the work in, the, in your will begin to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Like I said, your plans for God has incredible plans for you. He's going to use you. When you feel like you have been down in the dirty slumps, he's still going to use you. You can do the much dirt as you can. You can be wrong about everything, but God thinks you're smart. I tell you, I'm not, I'm not that smart. <laughs> My reading is not that good, but I try. See, God wants to use you no matter what. It doesn't mean how you look. It doesn't matter how you do. So... My next one is uncorrupted faith. This, to me, is your faith has been through, a, you've been through a lot. 12 years, I've been through a lot. School, this is my first year in middle school. And I'm telling you, I didn't know nothing about nine weeks exam. And when I first took it, I thought I did horrible. I didn't know nothing about how to get up on stage and preach, to, preach about God's word. But look at me now. I'm so fr I'm proud of what I've done. I'm proud of what God is going to work into you guys too. Now, if you don't hear anything else I said today, I'm going to tell you this. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It matters how many times you get up. Thank you. Great job. Amazing. Doesn't matter how many times you fall. It matters how many times you get back up. Man, oh man, oh man, I, I heard it this way as well, that it doesn't matter how you fall, it matters how you get back up. My goodness, what a word from Marie, who is 11 years old. My goodness gracious. I remember the first time that I, uh, that I met Marie, and um, it was on Empowerment Day last year. I had only been the youth pastor for about two, three months, and she had just been transitioning over into the youth ministry. And we had this particular empowerment day on a Saturday. And, and the speaker was asking for someone to come up on stage and pray. And uh, after we prayed, I looked around to see who could pray. And, and she tugs me on my shirt. And I turn around and I see nobody. <laughs> Jesus? <laughs> okay. And then finally she, she, she pokes me in my back roll here. And I was like, oh, Hey. There you are. And she said, Pastor Joe, uh, I want to pray. I said, I, at first, I didn't even know her name at that point. I was like, okay. I've seen her before. And I said, all right, awesome. Let's do it. And I tell you, she got on that stage. It was on this stage. And she prayed heaven down like nobody's business. There's a calling on her life. Yeah. There's a calling on her life like no other, and God's got some great things, and for her to come and do what she just did is absolutely incredible, as we have unshaken faith this morning. Amen? Yeah. 
Well, the second speaker that I've asked to help me preach this thing better than I ever could, would you help me welcome Wesley Thomas? So I'm Wesley Thomas, as Pastor Joe said, and I've been at City Church for my entire life. I would like to be a youth pastor when I grow up, and I know what I'm about to do will really help that dream to become a reality. I'm going to be talking about tested faith. So let's see what Peter had to say. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. My first point is valuable faith. In one of the verses I just read, it says that our faith is more valuable than gold. So in 1848, James Marshall discovered gold in California. And when word got out, everyone wanted to find it. An epidemic broke out also. It's called the California Gold Rush. We have all been taught about it in history class, of course. So people tried and tried. Some succeeded, but some failed. They would mine night and day, and sometimes still nothing. If we can understand how valuable faith is, or gold is to us, and how much we express our love towards that, how much should we put our faith? How much should we try to find that faith? They looked night and day and almost nothing, but we can find it in a matter of seconds, and we can have it all. In James, it says that when our faith is tested, it gives us more patience. And who needs more patience? I know I do. My second point is revealing faith. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. The way faith is revealed is through trials. And trials also makes us stronger. I know what you're thinking. I'm 11 years old. What do I know about trials? A lot. <laughs> Tests almost every day. Homework every night. Church, Sunday and Wednesday. Reading the Bible. My plate gets filled and I can't even chew. <laughs> and adults also have trials. They have to do with money, managing the jobs, and having a relationship with your family. And... I will have those trials when I get older, because we all have different trials in our different times of our life. Although our trials may differ in the seasons, they will still grow us and shape us to deal with more trials down the road. Think of faith as a tree. We have to hold on to that tree, and without trials, we can't make it stronger. My third and final point is centered on God's love. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. One definition of faith is belief and complete trust in God. Since faith is centered on God's love, and since we have faith in him, there is a relationship made between us and the Father. While understanding that we love God because he first loved us, we must have the faith to be able to love God. And I will end with this. Without faith, we cannot please the Lord. Thank you. Great job, Luke. Incredible. Our faith is more valuable than gold. Come on, what these middle schoolers, I just I don't can't even like they're they're producing this now. I can't wait to see them in a in a few years and and what God is going to be doing through them. And I loved what he said. If I can just reiterate, that's my job today is to kind of recap. They're carrying the weight of this message, and they're doing such a phenomenal job. 
But one of the things that, that he said that I thought was just amazing, um, growing up in the church, I don't know if you've heard this, but I heard this, that when I was 11 years old, uh, adults would look at me and say, oh, you think you'll go through trials now? Wait till you get my age when you got bills and you got this, you got that. Some of the parents are like, yeah. But listen, 11-year-olds are facing the same type of trials that you as an adult are facing in this room today, just at a different age. They may not be facing bills. They may not be facing mortgages and headache and, and taxes and, and whatever else that, you, that us adults would be facing uh, in this particular area. But listen, I've never seen our school system in the way that it is right now. Where there's some kids that are fearful to go to school, kids that are getting bullied, kids bringing guns to schools. Listen, this is a generation where they have so much weight on them and we need to be those people that pray them through the most difficult trials of their life to get them from point A to point B. Listen, the enemy wants to stop what God wants to do in their lives. And if you and I can partner together and just say, we will lift up a standard in Jesus' name against every fiery temptation and trial that the enemy has against them, I'm telling you right now, they will change this nation. They will change this world. I feel led to say this, and I don't know why, for this particular group, don't give up on your student. Don't give up on your child. Don't do it. And, and so for, for me, I know my parents are in this room, so I'll just use them as, as an example that my parents did not give up on me. That when I was at school and I was acting all kinds of crazy and a knucklehead, I, I remember there was one time that my dad and I stood nose to nose almost getting ready to fight. But he loved me so much that he was willing to take the blows because he wanted me to take my next steps. He wanted to see me grow and there was a time where he said, you know what? If you feel like you can do it on your own, here's the keys. Go. Actually, no, he said, give me back the keys to the house and go. But he knew, he knew that I would come back because he didn't give up. He didn't give up praying. He didn't give up in faith. And he was always there. Thank you. Love you guys. So don't give up. Don't give up. My last speaker for this morning's message is going to end us in a bang. Would you help me welcome Isabella Peckett? Hi, as Pastor Joe said, my name is Isabella Peckett, and I'm a student here in Wide Open. I recently moved here from Springfield, Missouri to Florida. So about a thousand miles away. And what I'm going to be talking about today is true faith. Now in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, he says, Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of, the, of Christ in the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you by, that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from, from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So my first point is, hang on. Your life may feel like it's over, that you can't do it, that you can't do anything, that all, everything you do is screwed up, but it's not. God won't give you more than you can bear because he, he, he's going to carry you through this. Like John says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So he says you're going to have trouble. It's bound to happen. It's a, it's a sinful world. It's not a perfect world. But he says... Take heart, because he has overcome the world. He's going to help you through that. So without timeless faith, there's nothing to hold on to. So that's why you need timeless faith, because timeless faith is what gets you through those hard times and gets you through those rough and choppy seas. So my second point is fruit. You always know someone by their fruit, because when someone has true fruit, they love God and they 
keep coming to church and they keep working and worshiping even when the hard times come and even when it's not easy. But you could say false Christians, they just, as soon as those hard times come, they turn to worldly things. They don't keep their faith in God. They keep, they just keep turning away and saying, oh, he, God put these things on me. He's not a good God. Or, oh, this bad thing happened. So he's not a good God because he didn't prevent this. But that's why you need tested faith because that is what brings up the impurities. That's what brings out those bad things and the human tendencies to just turn away. But that's what, that's why you need tested faith. Like Matthew says in 7, 16 through 18, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear good fruit, nor a diseased tree bear bad, bad fruit. Now my third point is true worship. Back in the Roman times, everyone worshipped multiple gods. They didn't worship the true God. And they named many of the planets after them. So Mars was named after the Roman god of the underworld, uh, of the of the Roman god of war. Venus was the Roman goddess of love and beauty. And Pluto was named after the Roman god of the underworld. So they named the planets, forever living planets, after their gods. So they cherished them so much that they named them, that they named those planets. So if they cared about their gods so much that they named planets after them, how much more should we obsess over our God? He's the one who made those planets that they named their gods. The Roman gods didn't even exist. They were figments of imagination. Someone made it up. They said, oh, we're going to worship these. We're going to worship war. We're going to worship love and beauty. We're going to worship these worldly things. But our God does exist. He's the one who made the planets. The grave is empty. How much more proof do we need? He rose from the dead. He, that's all we need. He rose from the dead. He defeated death. What else do we need? So what I want you to go home with today is this. Without timeless faith and tested faith, you can't have true faith. Because timeless faith gives you that thing to hang on to when those rough times come and when the hard things happen. And tested faith brings up the impurities in your faith so that you can keep worshiping God and you can always come back to him. And those things put together make true faith. Thank you. Timeless faith and tested faith produce true faith. I hope that you got that this morning. Some of us want true faith without being tested. Some of us want true faith without waiting for it, something to actually happen in our lives. That's why we need patience. We need that unshakable faith. See, even me on stage, I'm not going to lie. I wish that when I prayed for something that all of my prayers got answered like that. I mean, I think we all in this room would love something like that. But that wouldn't produce true faith. It wouldn't produce true dependency on a God that wants us to lean on him. I've said this before, and we've said the phrase that God won't give you more than you can handle. However, if he doesn't give you more than you can handle, then why or when would you be able to rely on him for those things that you can't hold up? But if he gave you everything that you can handle, then why rely on God? Why rely on God if he gives you something you can handle? But in turn, he says, you need me. And you can't do this thing without me. So trust in me. And in that trust... There'll be a time of patience. In that trust, there'll be a time of testing. And in that trust, it will produce truth. And the truth will set you free. This was such a powerful word from our middle schoolers about the significance of faith. That we just kind of 
you know, oh, faith, yeah, we need it. How much do you really need it? How much do you really need God in your world right now? How much do you really need God to answer something that you've been asking for for maybe years? Maybe this is your season where it just seems like, man, it's never ending. God, what is happening right now? Maybe you're in a season of testing. And it seems like every week just something's happening. My goodness, flat tire. The, something's wrong with the shingles on your roof. And insurance just went up because you got into an accident. Or just something happened. Maybe you got laid off on a job or you're trying to get out of this job to go to a new job. I just want to encourage you in this place. We're going to do something a little different because it's Youth Sunday. Is that okay? Because it's Youth Sunday, I always initiate an altar call on Wednesdays. And I feel like that's so applicable to this moment right now. That if you need God to intervene in your life, then I want you to take a step of faith and make your way to the altar here in just a few moments. If I can have everyone stand all across this building. That's the warm-up. Whenever God does something in someone's life, if you read through the passages of Scripture, he always asks them for an action step. He always tells them to take a step. When he healed the men of leprosy, what did he say? He said, go back and show yourself to the priest. Take that step to show yourself. When he healed the lame man, the pool of Bethesda, he didn't just heal him and walk. He healed him and said, take up your mat and walk. Take a step of faith. This morning, I want to challenge you, and maybe you're not the most comfortable with doing this, but it's Youth Sunday, so there's your excuse. It's something that's out of the ordinary, but we're firm believers here at City Church of taking your next steps, and I believe this is one of them, where you would step out of your aisles and come to this altar and just say, God, I lay it down at your feet that I'm being tested right now, that I'm, I need this sense of patience in my life right now, and I really don't know, but I want to produce true faith right here, right now, and I don't want to wait any longer. God, I need you to just intervene on my behalf. I'm sick. My family's sick. I'm in turmoil. I'm in darkness. I have fear. This morning I was talking to Esteban and he was telling me that one of the crippling things that is happening in our people today is fear. That you get a little bit of a headache and then you go to the doctor and you feel like it's a tumor. You feel like it's cancer and we're just overrun with fear. But this morning, I just want to let you know that Jesus is more than a conqueror inside of us. That Jesus silences fear. That by his name, darkness trembles. And we sang a song this morning that said tremble. And I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in that song again, tremble. Because darkness trembles. There is no weapon that is formed against the people of God that will prosper here this morning. And if you believe that word, come on, if that sets a fire in you this morning, I want you to make your way down to this altar right now. I'm not going to count to three. Let's do it right now as the worship team leads us. And let's say, God, this darkness has no place in my life. Fear has no place in my life. God, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Come on, would you make your way forward? Students, would you make your way forward? Adults, would you make your way forward? Let's not allow fear to cripple what God is doing in our lives. Let our faith cripple fear right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, lead us.